probably enough for you to actually just post it, like, we go to these programs and we have the, like, the trail of, like, this happening and so on and so forth, so. Yeah. Each program's got probably a different goal. We'll let you use your program and you know, know that happens. So you can do that currently as well, though. Like, you, you can, you can book on the BPF syscall, uh, the BPF probe LSM hook, uh, and then you can, like, dump, uh, you can, like, dump the whole instruction logic to the user space and ship it off the machine, right? So you can already do that. Yeah, and Marcus is already modeling this stuff and sending it to X to do execution. Well, but where Netflix is missing in the first place, I would say. We have one logs that can be post-analyzed, but for what? So maybe audibility tools or Sorry, which? <coughs> so I, I guess the terms of audibility, like what kind of thing is like source pulling or open sourcing? Like I don't know if Netflix is open source their like their basic source pulling is purely a cache event and then like a default of reference documentation or something to like detect that someone wrote it using some sort of like um so like if anyone could write one, right? But like if you're trying to hit the ninety percent like like is there any like easy thing to be done where people can just plug this in and use it? Yeah, Netflix has open source bits for trial. But but my point was the missing bits of the enforcement bits. Yeah. Because we we can observe all the events, log the best query, pull the new query, data analysis tools, internal tools. Uh, so when you say bring an enforcement, this is not a VLSM hook there. It's like when you've constructed a, a malicious trace, like you you opened a socket, you did this, you did this, and then after maybe some offline processing as well, you said, okay, this is bad, get it out. So I, Either that or sy synchronously in a BPF program. In a BPF. Just say, like, close the socket. Okay. Or, oh, where's the. You like, sit, like, I want to construct an RST packet on this, on this socket because it's like just RST, it's closed, it's dead. Okay, yeah, that's Things a like good that. idea. Like, like no. Close that socket. And then, like, sending signals is already possible, I think, Alex, I mentioned. Yeah, we can send signals. I'm just trying to think of what other enforcement stuff should be on the roadmap. Well, I think the general topic of enforcement here first. But this becomes more, I think people become, start becoming more aware of this when you, when you start writing telemetry. Like, if there is an open source telemetry implementation and an LSM implementation, you start realizing, ah, these are the bad factors I need to watch out for. And then you start doing enforcement decisions there. Uh, so there's a circular, we need to seed that conversation by starting these two areas, at least in the open source land. Uh, yeah, so like the audit bit is, uh, is is interesting. We discussed at Plumbers, audit has some like hooks in the kernel, which are uh, this very hard to parse all that information. But we we did, we we sort of found that these hooks are really use at really useful points in the kernel where the LSM hooks are not there. So typically you will have like a uh, in the LSM hook you have very minimal data like that that is that doesn't have the right context to be logged. And after the action actually has happened, this is when you act, this is when you want to do the logging. So there are different places where enforcement needs to take place and where auditing needs to take place as well. So I think the audit surface of BPF currently, uh, like say, you, you need, it's trace points, but uh, you can, sometimes you need to trace in the middle of a function, which you can't really do. So some sort of like, what we talked about back then but we didn't like get time to implement, look at how you can in extend audit with the EPF. So get the unflexible side of audit out and use it, use it like hook BPF programs to audit hooks. Yes, but I thought like you first of all uh, dropped this idea, right? We 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 dropped and this. No idea. one else was interested, so we dropped this idea because we were able to work around it, right? Like, oh. but it was quite a quite a long workaround. Like, if I imagine somebody is somebody is trying to. Uh, uh, they shouldn't need to invest like three months crafting an audit hook, which is just available to Linux audit in general, right? Like that, that, that is a. So, do you propose anything like specifically, or like just a wish list? Wish list, yeah. Like, wish list is to extend, like, be, be able to trigger BPF programs on an audit event, get the right context, and be able to lock that into the ring book. Then 
Yeah, yeah. So I imagine we need to get from like from the from get rid of the audit users first, right? But like just trigger VPF programs on like audit. I just don't want any audit users facing the audit policy language. I want to configure what events I want to log by like my own uh, uh, set of VPF audit programs. I want all of my security policy telemetry implementation to live within VPF. I don't want to mix them, and there are some cases where you actually required to like have audit enabled. Now that requirement then turns into like you configuring a this audit policy audit policy language. I think VPF VPF should sit in the middle there and like like they do IP tables. So people who want to write an audit policy use or VPF as a back uh, as, as a back end, right? And then people like me who want to do advanced stuff with that, they can uh, use VPF programs. Yeah, so politically it would be challenging, right? So you need to kind of split the guy. And that won't be one line patch. Yeah, it won't be. Okay. I mean, this is a road. This is a. This is like for more wishful stuff, right? We're not discussing bugs and stuff here. That's what I'm saying. Like write it down. It's just yeah. like I don't see anyone working on it. We will. Uh, maybe some somebody will look at the roadmap and is like, ah, oh, that's a good idea for me to work on. And they'll take it down. So I'm just writing it there anyway. Next thing, this is we alluded to this yesterday as well, right? The long-term future of unprivileged DPF. This is from a security perspective, like uh, it's 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 kind of sad that hardware bugs came along and it like pushed DPF into the root territory, whereas it would be really useful for unprivileged users to use DPF. So, what do we propose here? Like, are there some concrete steps we could take, or is this a broader topic? Then the BSC work with hardware people. So the, the, the only discussions that I've been in, like with Microsoft security people, is that um, the, which the, we don't allow unprivileged DPF at all, right? Um, uh, like we've imp even implemented that in Windows, and currently we don't have any plans to. But uh, the, the discussion comes up and says, okay, if you could somehow run VPF programs in a different address space, so there might be some scenario where you didn't care about hyper, right? That you might be able to run it in a separate address space, and that might be okay. Like pretend you're actually running in a separate. VM or something equivalent to that, where you can't do any side channel attacks because you're not sharing the same, you know, cache logs or whatever else. And so you might be able to do something in the same process if it's sufficiently separated. And what sufficiently is is probably a research topic. Yeah. I mean, charcoal concept, yeah. People can do EDPI like to allow uh, unprivileged VPF programs, but if we did, this is probably what, it, what would be required, but right now we don't have any interest in working on it until we actually have a use case where we want it. So, so will this like run into some security tools in yeah. containers? Yeah, yeah, there is a very big use case for uh, Containers is the is the bone of contention that comes to uh, Feel free to type in uh, in the doc as well. I mean, I'll put something under the cross-platform stuff, which overlaps a little bit with the uh, different address space for VPF programs. Mm -hmm. That is, there are some of those other runtimes. It's not the Windows or Linux runtime, or the ones on my slides that are all for uh, user land VPF programs attaching to some other runtime up there in, say, a user land daemon or whatever. And so for, for that, it's kind of a different address space. And so there's a little bit of overlap relationship between those discussions. They're not quite the same thing, but there may be some techniques that are in common between those two areas. OK. So container observability tools, I think it's a, it's, uh, it's a good one. Audit auditability of VPF events is, I, I cope one level uh, higher than the auditability stuff. This is what Jason was mentioning. 
there needs to be a reference implementation of yours. We tried doing something with an intern, but it didn't really uh, like go anywhere. Maybe we could just take off that effort and like have somebody uh, all like take this beyond some of the ring buffer stuff we've been implementing for process execution logging. Somebody should be able to like take that and deploy it on a, on a machine and see some event coming there, right? And this is where the audit stuff could like come in. So a project that enables DPF for telemetry would be nice to have. Would be. <laughs> so open. But there is already sys internals or whatever the whatever like Microsoft folks have, have developed. Uh, but there are some different ways they have not just for example they don't use BTF there. So maybe we could influence like such projects to use BTF or have a BTF based implementation of these things? Sure, there's things you can do uh, better. I think where Kevin and folks were starting is they wanted to also work for kernels that didn't have BTF yet. True, yeah. So they were saying once that, that went first and it would work for all of them and then if you can do BTF specific stuff to light up you know, extra you know, functionality or better performance or whatever it is, then sure. I'm going to move this or Yes, so I, well, I, I don't want my things, but I, I, the previous wording of that, I had a, a different idea in my mind, so I'll let, I'll let this okay. discussion yeah. play out. Okay, no, it's just fine. I, I'll just, I, this is done. We need, we may need to extend Linux audit to trigger BPF program to expand the audit surface, right? And we may, we also need a reference implementation in the open source that can show how you can do telemetry using BPF uh, for security purposes, right? I mean, this is, you can do observability already with a lot of tools, but then Brendan yesterday mentioned that there are talk to races that, that get, can come up, and these these observability tools are often not a good surface to do security telemetry with. So, okay. So, so what what I have in mind is mm -hmm. something along the lines of like, um, how do you get some sense of the integrity of the kernel in terms of how BPF programs are loaded? This program is loaded and attached at this point to this this thing, getting some sense of a log of what actually. Basically, what, you mean like what did this like BPF program BPF change a lot of stuff? So then, if like if you're if you come into the system afterwards, how do you go back and find out like what kind of stuff is happening in that system? Now, if you pre-deployed some say tooling, sure you you, have, you can put whatever in place that you need. But what if you haven't got that tool in the first place? Is there some way of knowing what programs are loaded and at what time, and maybe how they're attached to different things? Or mm -hmm. Some sort of like how has the kernel changed its mm -hmm. behavior? need a BPF snoop at least that just does probe attach and then just prints it out to blog it. Like it's executed. Process execution. Yeah. Yeah, program attach. Mm -hmm. As long as you can't kind of interfere with it. It doesn't kind of like uh, I hear what you're saying, but it doesn't kind of feel good. Yeah. So like well, I mean the BPF when it's loading it does like probing all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. before anything loaded and there's a bunch of other things. trying to like somehow figure out an understanding intent to the technical program will be so much noise that it will take it forever to I think one thing worth considering is what we discussed with a verifier uh, or notifier stuff, right? Like some events that you could that you can understand what the verifier is doing and attach a BPF program to those events. But then there is a circular thing, like you know. <laughs> Runtime generates a bunch of uh, trace events, essentially. 
load programs and attach and detach. You know, load and load, attach, detach, and generic operations like that. And that creates that system. Load and load, attach, detach, create map, map. Yeah, we already have that. You can attach the VPF probe, LSM hook, and then. We do this as well as the phone. That's what I'm talking about. Right. Load and create the VPF. Basically, all this is called the VPF probe. And then we push it into the local. Well, we push it into the GRP sync stream. It could go directly to the local. Okay. Unless it's a persistent log or something that you can go back in history for and see what happened over time steps. Usually, we get it all from node, right? When we got the node at the time step, usually it said, like, Does anyone want to add anything in the security section here that we might have missed? We did cover it in like the long-term future of unprivileged eBPF, right? Like, uh, how can we? When when will processors change enough that we will be confident enough to do, do that? So Alexa mentioned. Uh huh. Like, how do you make sure you can't do a side channel attack onto the container? So, so Alexa mentioned like the the end brand stuff from Intel. Uh, these 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 sort of things. How can BPF influence that? Like, how can how can we sort of start a dialogue in that area? Uh, maybe Linux Foundation or BPF Foundation can help us connect there. OK. Thank you. <laughs> cool. I think we, let's move to the next topic, and we can revisit if we find something. This is where like I would expect you folks to start chiming in more, because I'm not a compiler and libraries expert, so somebody probably uh, who, who works in the space would be better. Like, uh, so we just have like feature parity between LLVM and GCC backends. Uh, this was added by somebody. Uh, okay, I think that's a good one. How do we? One thing we we alluded to there, right? Like, how do we ensure that these compilers are behaving the same way? So, is is it just self test, or are we? Do we have like a uh, like a uh, compatibility test suite where you can say that LLVM and Clang are doing the exact same thing for their BPF backends. So that's the only thing we have. So mm -hmm. most people tend to use the one mm -hmm. common test because we get both everyone to the best. Okay. So. Yes. I think I think this is what we want, right? Like we we should try to make sure that one, given a piece of uh, code, there's one verifier, uh, there's one com there's Clang generates something, passes verifier, GCC generates something, it doesn't pass the verifier, or the other way around. So 
you want consistency between compilers for for uh, and the verification result for the verification result. But this is what we also discussed yesterday, as you were mentioning, Mikula, right? Like they have on a Clang patch submission tr trigger self test, and same thing for GCC as well. Now, you, you, we also, I, as a recap, I think we, we discussed that whether a revert on a submission would be acceptable to Clang people. We don't know. Maybe there is some, like, some, some community stuff we have to do there. Can you? Yeah, JIT is JIT is later. Yeah. We uh, yes. Okay. Is, uh, let's talk about libraries a bit as well because we we we've we've discussed quite a, quite some stuff in BSC about libraries and what sort of libraries uh, we encourage and stuff. Andre has like we have libbpf as the C loader. Then there are a couple of co libraries. There are some Rust libraries coming up uh, to load eBPF programs. Uh, do we want to give any guideline? Do you if wish list guidelines whatever in this space? Guidelines would belong to Brendan's talk, by the way, so we can backfill, but. Oh, I didn't even think about that. I mean, right now, like the like with the example for the section names, it's 
me to load something. <laughs> <laughs> Parse it without error, good. But like, no, no, no. I mean, like, Do you, do you think we should have like a self test? Like you have libbpf as a separate repo. Should we have self tests? They're not self then, but then there are there are tests. Should we have a tests repo that is not with the kernel? If it was, I would use it. It's a question of who would be happy to contribute as a repo and handle that. <laughs> <laughs> so we can write like everything we wanted. Like it would be great if like A, B, and C was perfect. I think I think let's at this particular point, right? We shouldn't think about the who, because I want somebody to look at this doc and they're like, maybe I'm going to do this. I like I like doing this. So let's decide the 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 resourcing part afterwards. Like let's figure out the ideas here. Could we, could we like, uh, so you mentioned L format standardization. Is it, is it even possible or that's never going to be a thing? We could give like a criteria of uh, this is, uh, I mean, at least section names. We shouldn't have 10 different ways to name a particular program section, right? Like this is just from a usability perspective. If I, if I want to today use my program in Java and then in like whatever, Go or something and then libbpf, I shouldn't need to change my program to do that. Yeah, wish list. So I think that wish list is like uh, the analogy from the compiler world. Like if you see as its own, has a little game as its own. And the high level of my two compilers are completely different than that. Well, I've seen several times people try and like GDP some self tests with their own game. And say, well, half of them are doing some kind of a game the other way around. And the LC that will never converge. They're still all separate and will stay separate. So compilers do the same work. But but they so do I mean, I mean, they do agree on like GCC and Clang a lot of things, right? Which are from a user perspective much easier to implement. For example, the Red Pauline thunk is the same in GCC and Clang. They could have chosen. No. It implemented differently. No, I agree. But like the the thunk, the name of the symbol itself, right? They agree on that. So I mean, they, I mean I, I'm saying like they, they from a, as as somebody who needs to implement it in the kernel, we could have had if GCC this thunk this symbol in the table. They 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 do agree on something. They do agree on sometimes the flag names and stuff. It won't be perfect, but like it could it makes users' lives easier when this when they try to use Clang and GCC interchangeably. So. Yeah, I think there, there, are, there are basic stuff like naming, name bike shedding should be eliminated so people focus on other things at least. I'm not going to call it LSM slash, I'll call it like security module or security slash. This, this sort of, st just, just take it away from the flexibility. Like usually, that's something less put it down, yeah. like yeah. by section names and try to. I mean, in practice, it should come from the user. So like, you know, if someone comes out with a new library and says like their own naming conventional stuff, like users should just try to like, we have the precedent, right? Like, why don't you follow? There's nothing wrong with like the precedent. <laughs> <laughs> you can't force somebody to use the same 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we right now the, the the standardization lives in libbpf, right? The, the the our view of the standard is the code in libbpf. We don't even have it anywhere, yeah. so. Okay, okay, then we can discuss. Yeah. We can add it. I move it there. Cool. So core is uh, something core. This is not core that uh, Andre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, core is a So the the goal behind is think about it like in 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 so many years when there is multiple ways to load BPF programs, you you our intention is to make it easier for users to use BPF programs. Right now, there are sysadmins, kernel people trying to use it. It's going to trans transcend towards applications, right? Even beyond then, once processor vendors get their stuff together, it, it is going to move to unprivileged users if, eventually. So at that point, you want to have like, you don't want to have like a scattered way of like L5, L format standardization. You want to have like, okay, I wish 10 years back I would have agreed on a format and this wouldn't have scattered so bad. So ship may have already sailed, but not, too late yet, I guess, from, from my perspective. Cool. So, uh, so I think like core is the other core, which is this group of people are more interested in here. Uh, the verifier. This was this would be nice because as as as, as like Dave mentioned that there are other platforms implementing verifier. So document the verifier behaviors and uh, for cross-platform stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the. Thank you for organizing this on the and being on the committee for organizing it. <laughs> Okay, we have a break with the VSC photo then.
about your motor or anything. You use some uh, some instrumentation and all of these shows as how it more more and more less uh, you do this like and try to modify the input. Uh, so that I believe more in. Like the tool that's smart enough to use some instrumentation to like try to come up with like a better input that like exercise like more more different process, right? Like the but that doesn't tell you anything about correctness. So it's like the approach that the verifier is yeah. Yes, but like we take T now, which is like so easily formalizable, and like to possess like the extent of like easily formalizable things in verifier, and like sure we will verify the shit out of like two percent of the logic. Right. That's Right. Yeah. Like cool. It was not a ninety-eight. Start. And, and and also like given the right of like changes to verifier, who's gonna? Yeah. That's pretty realistic, I guess. Really. Also, on the other hand, I mean, really, like the really core parts, if you're going to change that much, some areas. Yeah. Well, suppose we even like change one stuff, and like how much logic will work like around that? Easily. That's important. Yeah. Is it formalizable? I'm not even sure what it means, but it's good. If you formalize an AOU, I mean, I think the first step is just writing it, right? Like, this is what it is doing. And then the next attempt would be to come to formalizing it. Right now, the, the only place where it exists is the... I, I agree with you. With the rate of the verifier changes, what we write and what we formalize, there'll be obviously always a delta. But if there is now... If, if you can, like, verif, ver, create a feedback loop where you can say this is how... Uh, this is this pro this particular bit of program sort of represents this formal formal stipulation of the verifier. You could you could say whether it breaks that assumption or not. But uh, from the very beginning, just write stuff there. This is what is happening. This is this is how offsets are handled in the verifier. Uh, somebody who wants to implement a new verifier could read through this and and at least this is how the verifier is supposed to behave generally. Annotate the verifier strings itself in the kernel and generate documentation from there. Just a wild idea, but like no, uh, like this is what is happening here, right? Wild ideas, visionary stuff. It, but it's like in the in the technical roadmap, right? Like, I sometimes some questions we try to answer here are about resourcing, right, and feasibility. So some on on this roadmap, I, I and we'll we'll classify this, right, as in terms of various tracks these things belong to. For example, cross-platform documentation, formalization, and standardization and stuff. And then you effectively once this is not a roadmap currently. This is currently a wish list. This needs to be developed into a roadmap. And then you'll have some sort of a feasibility check. Uh, or annotations yeah. around this. There, I, I sort of agree that there is some problem if you make a roadmap and your roadmap nothing ever happens. Uh, agreed, so agreed. Now you have a roadmap and nobody does anything on your roadmap, it, it, it'll look bad, but, right? Yep. It'll be like, why did you bother creating your roadmap technique? So you, you remember, right? Like when we were, the, the, one of the reasons why we want to do this is, and this is this is currently not the roadmap. This is, these are notes from various couple of meetings and ideas. This is, is this should turn into a roadmap eventually. And some stuff will be punted where like folks will be like, hey, this is this is not a priority for us. We need to roadmap will also have like feasibility and prioritization attached to it. But currently it doesn't have any of that. So yes. Yes. Yeah. 
that's actually a very good uh, it'll give more benefit to the ecosystem for a developer perspective i think I would need to use Rust more to know that. Rust is really great at like explaining what's going on and how you can try to fix it. Okay. Probably like a significant portion of their code like will capture all the errors, analyze and all that stuff. Thanks, Joe. There are some attempts when you like obj dump BPF assembly, they will correlate some like lines to uh, assembly code as well. So. This is like the, the you you could go to a different room uh, in 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 even in even within like Google or somebody I like can like no way on earth I'm reading that assembly so like you could go to security folks somewhere uh, of course there's a reverse engineering section where people will be willing to read that but the people yeah, don't. Yeah, it's a whole, whole, yeah. One one thing which I feel uh, this this could need this could like make user experience better is when you're writing the BPF program, think of an IDE thing, right? And you know patterns. This helper returns an arg pointer to BTF ID or null, right? And then you're trying to dereference that pointer. Uh, please add a null check because your verifier will obviously fail here. 
So there are these obscure verifier errors, which ex advanced level programmers get into, and this needs obj jump and all that. But there's some very basic stuff for people who are, don't do that. It just like reduces one iteration. Max check, right? Like, yeah. So what this goes into is a general linter then for I, I do remember some Twitter posts around somebody writing some linter somewhere. I don't know where, what happened to that effort or how far did it go, or even are they suggesting the right suggestions in that linter or not? So you... Cool. Anything else you folks want to add in, the, in this ginormous verifier section? <laughs> Yeah. Syscaller does that, yes. What we what we need is a self test to like BPF code coverage metric, right? You run self test and you see what portion of the BPF code is actually tested. It'll be fun. Maybe we have a really good number there, right? And this will be like I mean, like this is true for any metric, by the way. Like you can you can game it, but you if you there's there's going to be a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. People who want to contribute code, they're like, there's some people who want to, like, for this stuff. Can I send a patch? What can I send a patch for, right? This would be a nice. You could actually trigger this on the CI. Uh, so when you actually accept a new patch for a helper, you, 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 you may be able to see that is this self-test that you're adding covering most of your corner cases? Maybe you can say, can you add a case for this? This will help your maintainers will be happy to review patches because they'll have some help doing it. Like CI is already helping you, it gives you a signal of uh, this is absolutely unacceptable, and then you'll have more metrics to work on. So code coverage, let's just add it here. I'm going to split them into categories, and then we go into prioritizations later on in the BSC meetings. Uh, I mean, we we can we we can we can give we can assign a pro we we can say that this will have a higher impact, right? Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. 
register blinding. Just yeah. Like one line. Like, now that we've dealt with this for long enough, we know what it is. Yeah. Tiny URLs. <laughs> Embed tiny URLs in the kernel verifier message, which link to like descriptions of what the error is. <laughs> we we do that internally. Like we will have a short link that says like read go slash or like read whatever bugganizer for more information here. So tiny. Uh, JIT compilers, this is fun. Uh, <laughs> so one of the thing is the cross-platform stuff and calling conventions, this is, uh, this I really care about actually, feature parity amongst architectures and probably also then operating systems. Uh, ARM, we saw that there was a gaping hole in the whole, the whole trampoline stuff, which is now getting fixed. I'm very happy that this is, hap this is going on. Uh, but. ARM still has multiple things missing, I think. Like there is a, a dispatcher is still unimplemented, I guess, on ARM64 or? I think so, yeah. You, how did some analysis of what is the missing stuff? I, I think it's already there. Uh, the combination has a Atomics, it was added in February, I think, like the end of February, Atomics were added this year. Can you, okay, actually, this is a good time to switch. So what is the what do, what do the maintainers think on like uh, so now when you accept patches for the BPF JIT for new features, at, as the ARM JIT is going to reach almost feature parity with the trampoline stuff going in, will you folks recommend that hey you're submitting this feature can you do it for this stuff or is that too much of a The, 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 I think the main problem there is for to ask somebody who is not familiar with an architecture, right, MIPS, S390, whatever, to write architecture-specific assembly code. Uh, yeah, it's very hard. Yeah. So you, you've, we talked about yesterday about ARM-based VMs on like uh, on on cloud. Is is this something that to enable this stuff from happening more easily, could we like have machines that people can access for different? V, v, uh, Camu works, man. Like we have Camu uh, support for S three ninety. Yeah, I think this is not feasible from a. Yeah. It, is this a small change? Yeah. That the maintainer can force it? Yeah. Is this larger where it really goes into the architecture details, like the tech scope stuff? Yeah. Then it's more difficult to 
I mean, you might need to gate a feature, right? Like that's, I mean, that, that's, I think it's a case by case basis. Uh -huh. At some point, you might say like, we're not going to take this feature because we don't know if it's even what, like we don't want to have, you don't want to get into a place where you have a feature that could not be done on a different platform. So this, this is actually a very good point, right? Like the whole trampoline stuff, uh, there were some initial discussions around like whether text poke BP is, is synchronous. On, we had the talk yesterday as well, synchronous on all CPUs. Uh, so yeah, just a feasibility check, I guess. Like, can this even be done on architecture? Add the architecture maintainer there. Could you do you think it is possible for this stuff? I mean, it's it's like networking, right? Like, whenever there is some bigger feature added, then the typical way to get your code merged is that you have to show that it works not just on your driver, but also on one more. Yeah. Also on one other driver, so it's generic enough. Yes. We never have? We would never have if you have Lambda in a fancy app, not that LSM. It's done now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I agree. This is, uh, but it's not like a feasibility check in terms of implementation gating, right? You can just check with the maintainer. Do you think, sometimes you, you build enough context, like with the maintainers have been reviewing architecture specific code anyways. So you can sort of ball, it doesn't have to be always accurate. Like it's not that, uh, it's just your yeah. This is I I know this is not possible on on this stuff. So are we are we doing ourselves a disservice here for that? For the window stuff, how does the JIT work? Do do we do you have a JIT? Yeah, UBPF jitter. UBPF jitter. Okay. Cool. Okay, so I think let's move on to the yeah, yeah specification uh, stuff. This is your section. No, it's yeah. Okay, so architecture specification related conformance test suite that could be shared between platforms. I don't know who wrote this though. Strike it. This is just more self yeah, I think everything just hinges now on self-test being, <laughs> yes, which is actually not a bad, which is not a bad thing to be honest, right? Like, but that's a theme, that's a theme that starts to emerge. Uh, okay. Yes, network. Yes. Let's just, yeah, let's go to networking completely. Yeah. So one thing I, I added there, which I would love to see, um, is some performance reports, like we, like the, we do the for, to, for the different drivers, mm -hmm. in the hope that this gives a clue for users what, what they can expect if mm -hmm. they have a different configuration, but also to put pressure on the different vendors yeah. to actually optimize their craft. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those two things are done by the same organization. Mm -hmm. Sometimes 
sometimes the, the writing the test is done a lot by one organization and the execution is done by somebody else, like UNHILL, for example, yeah. which runs stuff for lots of organizations. As you know, it's outsourced that part. Uh, but yes, I would pay for that too. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, but under the UNICEF Foundation. Yeah. UNICEF is closing? Yes. The UNICEF Foundation is closing, so it's not being used right now. Yeah, that would be that something that's being I would, I would, yes. <laughs> Alex is not here. Alex. Yeah. It's. Yeah. I mean, we'll probably have to do the benchmark. Yeah, you've got to write a performance benchmark. Yeah. Agree that this is the thing that is going to be the benchmark. Yeah. They want the, the benchmark tested, so if we can bias towards it, we can test I mean, it. if you really want to get sort of opposite and get things done, you could have like a compliance test. And then you have a compliance, but this is on the page, right? You'd be like, oh, well, is there a TX trans and trans and failure or not? So, compliant. compliant with what? Compliant with like. With the TX trans and compliance. Okay, yeah, okay. On the XTS return yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's actually. Yeah. That's a good idea. Because, uh, like, we're, we're, we're sort of stalled in a lot of spots in XT, right? And, like, I think this would be a message that they put on there. So, Daniel, I think this is, we, we discussed the XTP stuff, or you want to talk in particular about feature parity documentation? No, I mean, that's, that's the compliance. Okay. Right? Okay. So That would make it, make it easier to push back on like feature development on like the slow mix. Like, yeah, like, it's, it's actually like the XTP multipath stuff, it was yeah. developed in the slow mix. The, yeah. And it, it's just fun, but we also want to make sure that it works for yeah. like 100 gig, and exactly. 200 gig, and so on. Okay, so this is like basically the BSC will provide a lab access for some developer who's trying to work on them. Okay. Yeah, that's sounds. Is anything else we want to talk about on the networking side beyond XTP? So the NICs are going to ship with boxes that are saying BSC compliance certified. A little B. And yeah. <laughs> Don't mistake it for Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> so the, then we have, I, I think there's, before we go to developer excellence, there, there are new use cases coming up like HID uh, for uh, BPF. Do we think of other use cases in the kernel that could benefit from BPF that we haven't touched yet, but we should? May want to at some point. We talk. <laughs> uh, scheduler is one thing we've talked about, like with the uh, Ghost project, right? Like implementing a shed class in BPF, like the the the. I don't know. How has probably. Going 
the idea, right, so those are some example categories of things that are kind of like congestion control, I guess mm -hmm. it's purely local, right? Local allocation of different types of ideas. I think my take is on new use cases. I mean, we could probably give some, I don't know, high level areas where we would think that mm -hmm. could appear in the use cases, but the actual, actual concrete things, they probably have to come out from production issues. You're from users, yeah. Yeah. Like, got it. Let's move to developer excellence quickly because we we've we've touched on this in in areas right, and and for one main one thing that we uh, uh, discussed internally was somebody who was trying. Yes, we are. Yep. So yeah, like uh, imagine on the bpf.io website, you have like a program and uh, program uh, attachment type and a sample that shows up and explains what is happening and what is going on there and what what you can what you can do that. Currently, for us, we were we were trying to look at sock ops and all these uh, at least especially the networking stuff for people who don't understand that much uh, too well. It was hard to figure out like how do, how do you even get started? But self test then, right? But that's not a great place to document things. Uh, so, I think, I think we're getting there with like the, the documentation along the genome data system, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We have a notion of how you can do that for the various different types of network. Like, it just requires somebody to go through them and check out the but, but in the kernel sources, right? So, that's in the kernel sources. Yeah. Generating into the kernel talks. So, if you're a kernel or okay. Yeah. However, over like see a sample program. Like what what can you do with this kind of program? Like with Yeah, we're distinguishing between the JSON the Linux docs and the EPF docs. And then the EPF docs that could be cross platform or yeah. platform specific. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff doesn't have overlap, but there can actually be more platform specific stuff and Linux specific docs and specific balance structure. Yeah. Also good good place to know like what works where, right? Yeah, yeah. Have a little bubble that says yeah. Yeah. Linux, yeah. Windows. Yeah. Okay, I think somebody wrote like BPF standard library C headers uh, or an easy to consume code example for getting started for BPF library side. So it's, it's I think I think it's a it's a good idea. So we'll put it as a part of the uh, roadmap somewhere in this developer ecosystem side. Complexity analysis or BPF program. We we talked about this right. Uh, so this is, and debuggers is something we didn't touch. I've never used a debugger on an eBPF program. I just stare at the code and like try to figure out what went wrong where. But that's also, I do it with the kernel as well. But that doesn't mean that this is the way developers should normally Maybe operate. I'm not writing bugs. <laughs> <laughs> There's an RNA for that. Yeah. So, yeah. This is something we're actually working on. Hopefully we'll have some details and stuff by the time we think the eBPF summer. Yeah, plus one on this. I didn't Oh. But uh, in, like in, in general, I think what would be useful to, I don't know, have more debugging possibilities in the verifier, but also like on the runtime itself, where mm -hmm. you can really see whether it matches with like security issues and other things. I mean, I would have loved to use this. So, so currently for me, sometimes what happens is the verifier is going to give me an E in Val, right? Uh, especially with the preload programs where you don't get the verified trace back. Uh, and then I, I go in, in these e inval locations where there's not even an error message, and I put print case, right? Uh, I think that could be done. <laughs> yeah. So a, a general 
development betterness with error messages and and uh, uh, better error messages and also debuggers on the vpf side but you can can so for the thing we talked about security policy stuff right where you have callbacks there could we just have like callbacks from the verifier that says this is the verifier context that is available currently uh, and inspect that somehow just debugging i guess the answer here is to why why a, why a program fails to verify? Yeah. Why it fails to verify? Yeah. Sometimes you don't get them. Sometimes you get it from a e inval from like some BTF context access or something, and it doesn't have a log there. Yes, I I. I Yeah. Okay. I would also love like to have something like a prop test run and then use the I don't know, internal either the chill in stuff or the internal interpreter and then like single step through it and, mm -hmm. and see what is the actual content of the registers and do the yeah. like looking at this side by side with the verification log, does it still uh, hold those constraints when you pick bugs in the verifier? But it's, it's maybe more like for for uh, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ID support is we we talked again about this some sort of linter some sort of things that can autocomplete stuff add section names like do all that stuff you shouldn't spend time doing, right? Figure out, I want to write a program that is modify return or like LSM, just generate all of the. Proper function name autocomplete is probably the easiest to build. I mean, don't you have that VS code right now? As long as you, you know, VPS helper set eight that has a prototype in it. So things like helper function name, you can get all the completion right now. That works. The, for me, the main painful point in VS code that I would like to, I, I use VS code so I can. I, I know, that's why. <laughs> so I, I think the, like, I want to do uh, implement an LSM program, right? Big signature LS of the LSM hook. You go to LSM hook, def, LSM dot S, BPRM check security, or like security, I don't get accessor. Copy that signature from the LSM hooks, hook def dot H or something, and then bring it here. That could be effectively auto completed for like from a developer perspective. Tracing, what kind of functions can I trace? Maybe some sort of information from VM Linux, start a, VM Linux that, hey, you're trying to trace this function, but this is already inlined, so you are going to run into issues, right? Like. Yeah. 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 I mean. So let me just write this down. Let's move on to observability so that we can speed the session up a little bit. Uh, so Brendan, probably your section, maybe I added it, I don't know. <laughs> I was adding bits. Okay. We've talked about some of this before. Yeah. More trace points, DFS trace points. I think you said heap tracing yesterday for the Java Java stuff, right? And you probe speed up. Uh, yep. Using it, we're mm -hmm. doing a bunch of 
incorrect stuff we don't do. And so, yeah, it should be a new era of trace books, more trace books. Not too many, just some. <laughs> Next LWN article, there should be a new era of trace points. I, I, I agree with this. I think this is, uh, is there generally pushback when you add more trace points these days, or is there? Okay, so I think this is this is all this is all great. Uh, documentation we've we had a documentation section. We have another one. Yeah, yeah. So th there is like relationship to tracing mechanisms. <laughs> I I don't know. Okay. You know what would be nice is Okay. I, I think, yeah, I've, I've seen that particular post. So, yeah, so is this even, so the one quick question around tooling stuff. So BTF support for inline function tracing, is that even possible? I don't think so. What, what do you want to do? What? <laughs> what do you want to do? So I, I see that Dwarf has, I, I, I mean, I, maybe I mis, uh, this is a misconceived notion here, but Dwarf has some information of like what function got inline where. This is how debugger sort of single step stuff. Uh, could that be put into BTF somehow, or is it just a lost cause? For kernel probes. Somebody from compiler land. Okay. Okay. You can attach some. The, the, the attachment is going to be because there's no, there's not going to be a knob you can patch there, right? Like. <laughs> Cool. I think this is this needs more expert exploration, but I I also think it's a it's a tough ask. The, when you say inline functions are already like these things, but I I'm, I'm looking for those functions that compiler automatically inlines. Or maybe at least some information from the from hint from the kernel that this thing you're trying to probe here, you think it is uh, uh, like could. I'm trying to wrap my head around is like, what are you trying to probe? Because the inline is going to like, 
You, you, I, I, I think this particular. As a human, yeah, yeah. As a human yeah. find the offset, and then you could attach that offset. But here we're talking about the no, but I, I, no, not human part. I, I, I think this was. I think there is some information about what got inlined where in dwarf. I'm, or maybe. It is like the, like five branches where the code from the inline function is. I'm saying like, what if like the compiler generated code in such a way that like the first part, like physically first part, right, like with lower addresses, uh -huh. was actually not the first one to be executed because there's some jump, yeah, jumps yeah. back. And yeah, makes this sense. Is, like, all bats are off. There is no function anymore. Okay. So I'll just delete this then. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, this is like in wish list and feasibility. If we establish the lack of feasibility, then. Generally in the kernel. So uh, I'll, I'll move to standardization. This is uh, one thing in tooling. Is it possible for in in the skeleton stuff? Would it be would you would you accept something like this, like extensibility of BPF tool to generate custom skeleton snippets, uh, like so? Like I, I, let's say I want to do attach. But in the attach, I want to send an RPC. Uh, it can be reasonably and generically formatted with your code. It shouldn't be something else. Like this game chain things, we should say like, why do you, why do we need to prove and write that? Like if you have like, you get object, you write all the programs and like you chain them and like do whatever you want. Uh -huh. you can customize it, right? No, the use case we have is like there. So imagine we want to use PPF tool skeletons, right? But the underlying code that gets generated, we want to customize some of that so that while we can retain the tooling from like an open source implementation to some custom internal stuff, uh, the interface remains the same, but we can provide different snippets that get generated there. Now, we could patch BPF tool on top and, and, and do that, but it would be nice to have some extensibility to what skeleton can generate. So like templates, right? Like a skeleton template of some sort. So imagine like when I do a BPF prog load, right? Instead of doing like a BPF sys call here, I want to do an RPC. I want to retain the the. What are you doing? Can you give me the summary again? Sorry. So, in BP, I want to retain the skeleton API, right? Like BPF prog load attach whatever. But in the load, I want to do something else, right? I want to do. Oh, let's forget about the RPC, right? I want to do like a, uh, the, there's a BPF says call. I also want to increment a counter some, running somewhere or like a, some statistics.
So like, do, will we? Uh, let's not use precedents here, right? Like, I mean, uh, we, the, so we go have, like Go has that, for we example. The same use case. We also do the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Like I know that engineers always want like more options, more flags, more features, more everything, but like there needs to be a balance, right? You can't like keep adding stuff on, on, on traditionally all the time. Like like next thing will be like why don't we have a callback before some skeleton function is called an after? And then like in between and all that stuff. And, sure you can technically. We do we do like So no, so so I I want like I want this uh, for example for BPF programs that are loaded in the perf tool, right? For example, you want to use BPF skeleton, just keep the same interface. You don't want to specify custom stuff there. Uh, that uses a default template, and then on on like in the data center deployment, you want to do something else. You want to in, in create, add some instrumentation there, but you want to keep that interface the same. You want to keep using BPF tool, uh, but just change the template under the hook. I, I, from from my side, this is like a feature request, and it makes the whole sort of not keep using BPF, not requiring to patch perf or not requiring to patch like BPF tool, but keep be more. Uh, Or any or like anything, anything. I, I, I'm not implementing. I'm not giving it the implementation. To you. I'm like I'm not even. I, I just know that there is code gen functions in BPF tool because I saw it two days back. I had not even read that code before. Yeah. No, the the use case is that people want to load BPF programs in perf, which use which should use a standard interface, right? But then the same thing when deployed on in, in another, you don't want to like have something that is checked into open source, like not that is using BPF tool. We yeah, we can maintain our custom patches on top as well. Flexible skeletons, which they are not generally. <laughs> Add muscles to the skeleton. Make it move a little bit. <laughs> Everyone gets their own skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that matters. So uh, it's fine. We can discuss this later. Yeah. OK. So standard. Uh, So current instructions, verifier behavior, ELF layout, Cori format, PTF. Uh, Standards. Okay. Okay. That's it. I so I think the next steps for us will be like we'll discuss, arrange these into like mix and match the categories, prioritization or like we um, impact metrics or desirability metrics, and then publish a more simpler version that is not running node stock. So f verifier messages, right? Like, 
somebody somebody combing through the verifier and and like printing the stuff documentation for for sure standardization stuff uh, your network performance funding Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> oh.